So good evening, everyone. I'm really glad that you arrived. Uh, hopefully, some more people will arrive. But it's uh, I'm super happy uh, that you find your time and will listen what I will tell you. So basically, we're going to be talking games. Uh, the, you see the name of the talk, Games versus Education. Uh, so you will hear about mobile games, about PC console games, and these sort of things. Um, and we will try to find things that actually educate the players and uh, how it's affecting them. So we can skip this, we can skip my introduction. Uh, as was said, I'm right now running uh, Czech Game Developers Association, that's the gda.cz, and if you would like to know more about our activities, uh, it's the link, the last line, uh, gda.cz, uh, where you can learn about uh, us and who are our members. Basically, uh, our members are all the major Czech studios, um, so maybe you know some of the games that they created. So. Firstly, because I've been introduced, I would like to know who you are, and I'm, uh, you don't need to be worried, I'm not going to be asking you individually for your name and um, other stuff, but I prepared just like three basic questions that will probably help me to realize who is my audience and maybe a little bit shape the talk so it will suit you better and you will learn the best stuff possible. So the first question is, uh, is there any of you, uh, so just raise your hand, is there any of you who is actually like game developer and working on a game or like creating game or maybe thinking about it uh, to, to enter this industry and become game developer, let's say within a year or something like that. So are there any game developers in the audience? So please raise your hands. Awesome. I see like four or five people. That's great. That's great. So maybe some of the stuff you will learn, uh, you probably already know. But on the other hand, I have the second question, which is look like completely opposite. And do we have in the audience anybody who never played any game and just doesn't know anything? So we have one like that. That's perfect. Or maybe two. That's awesome. So we will try to find some balance. Uh, so some things for the game developers will be um, already like uh, very well known but uh, for the newcomers it will be probably like all new stuff so the third question I have uh, because I'm uh, from Czech Republic uh, I'm running Czech Association I've been developing games my name uh, my uh, myself uh, is question that if you uh, so this is not like raising your hand, but just shout at me. If you know any Czech games, the games that have been developed in Czech Republic, do you know any Czech games? Kingdom Come. Okay, Kingdom Come, we will be talking about it. I got it here on the screenshot. Any other? Of course, that's, that's the game that we will be able to try. I don't have it. Do you know, do you know this game? Okay. Exactly. That's a game by Amanita Design. Uh, created in 2009, Machinarium, and it was worldwide hit, and it's still selling quite good. Uh, and this game, anybody know what the game is? Ma Mafia, of course. That's like probably the best known game from Czech production. This is actually Mafia 2. It's a series of game. Mafia 1 was released, I think, 2002. Mafia 2 was released in 2009. And the recent one, Mafia 3, was released uh, recently, three years ago, in 2016. But some people don't consider the Mafia 3 a uh, Czech game, not, not Czech game anymore, because the studio was bought by US company Hangar 13. But originally, it's been created by Illusion Softworks, later on 2K Czech. But still, even Mafia 3 was developed mainly by Czech developers. And obviously you mentioned Kingdom Come, and I will be talking about this game quite a lot. But I said three questions, but I got bonus question. Uh, some of you mentioned some games. Can you guess, probably guess, uh, what's the best uh, game from Czech Republic in terms of selling numbers? So basically best selling game. Can you, that's really hard. Arma, close. 
That's a Czech game, of course, created by Bohemia Interactive. But it's this game. Can you realize that? What's that? The game, I, I will tell you, the game is called Euro Truck Simulator. This one is Euro Truck Simulator 2. And actually, this is really the best selling game from Czech Republic. Uh, the point of the game, you are basically a truck driver driving on a highway, usually just straight line for hours. And that's fun for some people. And they are buying it like crazy. So uh, really, uh, there is no like uh, racing or anything. The point is to deliver cargo and other like quests you need to do. But mainly, the people enjoy just like seeing the countryside, playing radio. You can tune in real radio stations and these sort of things. So this is like first graph. I got some data in the in the in the beginning. So these are like the Czech games. Uh, sorted, a little bit sorted, there are some mistakes, <laughs> uh, based on how, how well they, they, they've been selling. So probably that's not that important, uh, but I want to start this whole talk um, about the impact and how big the, actually the industry is. So that's my first, first like official slide, and that's this, this uh, graph. Uh, the data, it's from a company called Newzu. So here's the thing. We are at a thing called Science Cafe. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a researcher. I'm a game developer. Uh, we are, as an association, doing a little bit of research, but not much. So I usually be referencing uh, some data from others, like this one. The thing this I'm trying to show you is how actually the market of games is massive. And probably these numbers won't tell you much. This is like prediction for next four years. So only the number for 2018 saying that the market uh, value or like revenues of the market is 138 billion US dollars. It's insane amount of money, but probably it just doesn't like tell you much, right? The thing that this graph shows quite well is that the industry is constantly growing on a worldwide scale. So the prediction right now is that it's going to grow by 9%. And games are part of something called creative and cultural industries. And you can't see this effect anywhere. So games did not reach any peak. We are still growing and growing really fast. And to give you the numbers in better perspective is the next graph. And I promise you that's the last graph you will see in my presentation uh, because they are boring. But this is comparison which was already set in the introduction, and that's uh, how the uh, video games are compared to music and movies combined. So we, at some point, were super happy as game developers and game industry that we surpassed, and that was already somewhere around 2008, when revenues from games and how much money people spent actually in games uh, were bigger number than movies and music together. But in 2017, or somewhere around it, it's actually double of these industries together. And uh, more or less same numbers uh, works, of course, on lower scale for, for Czech market as well. These are global numbers. But that's not just about the money, right? The, g the games got other impacts, and uh, I've got some, some like worldwide games until we get to the education, and we will get to that. But we need to see how impactful the games are. So if we get any number, like how much time people are actually spending playing games, that it's <clears throat> bigger number than any other form of entertainment from various researches. Also, games got huge reach. So how many people are actually in touch with particular game? So these are premium games. The games are actually sold by uh, fixed price, and you are getting the whole product. And they are for computers and consoles. And what's common among these games, one is God of War. That's not important what these games are. These games all reach 10 million people bought or more bought these games. These are one of the best selling games for last year for 2018. So <clears throat> 10 million copies for a game that actually is not that cheap and cost like $60 is massive crazy number. That, but that's just part, one part of games industry. Right now 
games industry are also mobile games. And mobile games, developers probably know this very well, right now are dominated by something called free-to-play. It already started back in 2010 when, <clears throat> or 11, when Apple, or like on, on a mobile sector where Apple introduced microtransactions and these games were distributed for free and they are earning money through like micropayments that people are buying additional content, some bonuses within the game and this sort of stuff. But why I picked these games? So one is Angry Birds, the other one is Clash of Clans and maybe you don't know much, the last one that's the Hill Climb Racing. They've got actually two things in common. One is that they are super successful and that they are successful to the point that they've been downloaded because they are free over one, uh, hopefully I'm right, right, one billion times. So one billion people, which is like crazy number, downloaded each of these games. So first one that reached this, this peak first in the world was Angry Birds. And a few years later, Clash of Clans reached that as well. And also this like 2D side-scrolling racing game with little fancy cars also been downloaded more than one billion times. That's a massive reach that the games can actually create. And that's why they have this huge impact on current society. And also the second, I said that they got two things in common. Second thing that can anybody guess what was the second thing that they, these games got in common? Uh, apart from there are mobile games, of course there are mobile games. All these games were created in Finland. Uh, Finland's got only five million people. It's a small country and these games are the worldwide hits. So it's quite interesting why it's happening there and why they are so, so successful on the mobile sector. And there are many reasons for that, and we probably won't be thinking about it. One of it, like, it's the impact of Nokia and, and, and uh, the result of it, but there are many others. But what's the future for games, right? What's the future for games? That's just guess. We don't know. Maybe it's going to be like AR stuff. Minecraft is uh, one of the most successful games. Minecraft is creating f something from augmented reality. Maybe it's the virtual reality that you will be able to try. So I brought with me a game from Czech Republic called Beat Saber. Maybe you, some of you mentioned it. Here is a trailer. I will play it. So you have idea what it is about. Sorry. I will lower it a little bit down, uh, volume down, because uh, I will be talking what's actually happening. So this game is for virtual reality. You've got this crazy headset on your head, and you don't see what's actually happening around you. And th this is super easy gameplay. You are, you've got these two laser swords, and you are slashing just cubes. That's it. In the direction of the of the arrows, and sometimes you have to avoid something. But that's about it. It's super simple. But why I'm uh, I mentioned this game apart from the fact that it's a, a Czech game is that this game showed um, that even such a niche market as virtual reality still is can become a global hit. Uh, this game was released uh, last year in May, uh, and by the end of the year they reached one million copies sold, uh, which can uh, or can seem like much for some, but because the uh, virtual reality market is pretty complicated, you need to have the device, sometimes you need to have powerful PC, it's, uh, it's showing that this, this is growing and uh, Beat Saber is right now by far the best selling game in the world. They are probably getting close to two, two millions, so they are far ahead from, the, from their competitors. I will skip the rest of the trailer because it's more or less the same and I won't be bothering much about the Czech game industry because there are some numbers how we are standing 
Maybe the only interesting thing is that the turnover, the revenues of Czech games are 132 million uh, US dollars for last year, which is very closely thousand times less than the global data. You saw that for 2018 on one of the previous slides, it was 130 something billion in US dollars worldwide. So we are a super small fraction of the global market because we are a small country, but some of our titles are super, super successful. And of course the games are um, heavy export, exported. Uh, if you are interested in these sort of numbers, uh, I brought with myself a study and research that we actually did about the Czech game development industry, and it should be available somewhere around there. Uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a research of various data about the industry. There is a list of companies and some other interesting stuff. So you can, you can take it with you, uh, it's free, and then read it at home if you'd like to. But to the point and main point of this talk, games versus education. So uh, I, this is my classification that I will be following in this talk. So uh, I choose that uh, to divide the games uh, to one group, which I call educational games, or it's usually called educational game. Then we've got serious games, and then we've got purely entertainment games. Uh, the difference and the reason how why it's divided is that what's the purpose of the game design? Uh, what was the purpose? Educational games, the purpose is to educate you, entertainment is to just uh, enjoy the game and, and entertain you. So that's the difference. We will be talking about it and this is how it's going to be. I will be showing example of uh, some representatives of these different fields, and then I will talk more more about it. Because again, uh, we are at the Czech Embassy, and I'm from Czech Republic, I will be choosing intentionally mainly Czech examples, but you will realize, or probably if you follow a little bit more games industry and games overall, that there are plenty of other examples from, from other developers that are more or less similar. So the first group was educational games. I've got a company called Lipa Learning that actually is doing such games and they are targeting uh, very young kids from age 4 to 8, uh, usually like preschools and basic schools. And the, these games are teaching you so, like simple stuff, like uh, uh, realize what animal is, it is that you are playing with within the game. It's, uh, it's teaching you colors, it's teaching you like sorting out shapes, it's teaching you like movement of your hand so you are prepared for writing and then and later editions of some of the games you actually will be learning writing and reading and some mathematical stuff. So it's really like basic stuff for small kids uh, but it's a start. So I've got some screenshots from these type of games and uh, it probably won't tell you much but uh, you can find this on App Store. These games are for tablets. But if I move a little bit forward in the age of the, of the players, uh, we've got a studio in Czech Republic called Charles Games that actually created educational game called Czechoslovakia 3889. And the, the purpose is to teach uh, students, teenagers uh, at high schools uh, a little bit of history. And the game, I got a trailer for it. So I will play the trailer, hopefully. Okay. So again, I'm going to be talking to that. So this game, as you can see, is a combination of many different things. On, at one point, you see something like documentary with live actors. Sometimes there is archive, uh, uh, archive footage. 
sometimes there are these comic style things that's unco uh, uh, uncovering new stories and sometimes there are some puzzle games. The thing is that even the, the live uh, acted parts are actually interactive and you are doing some at one point some interviews, you are making some decisions, you are giving the actors some hints, so you are actually influencing even the acted part. In, in, in uh, the comics part, you, you are doing, all, again, you are unco uncovering some story and so on. And then you are uh, testing what you learn through some mini games and puzzles and these sort of things. So this is an example of the of the dialogue that you can you can choose from. This is the the comics part where you like sometimes uh, have to find something. Sometimes you just uh, learn new stuff. Then you're playing such mini games. So I combine these two two games together or these two type of games together and just quickly oh, uh, introduce you what they are about. But I didn't tell much you how they are actually educating people. Uh, so that's the, the, the last slide where I will be talking about that. So these educational games are really created with the purpose to educate kids. But what does it mean? And is it working? And what's common for these educational games? The common thing is that they usually and most likely require some sort of assistance. If you give this game to the player, and it doesn't matter if it's a kid's game that's uh, created uh, by Lipa and do it, uh, give it to four-year-old, or is, if it's a, a Czechoslovakia game for like 14-year-old, it won't be working on its own, usually, because it requires somebody to tell you. In the, game, uh, in the case of kids, kids, uh, kids' games, it requires the parents that will be going through the quests and through the tasks that the kids should do and giving him or her hints what's necessary to do and sometimes uh, give, the, give the child some feedback and sometimes just help them and sometimes just explain the rules. And in case of these uh, educational games for uh, older kids, it again requires uh, the teacher that is actually working with the class. And that's uh, like uh, checking what they are doing in the testing phase. Because the cycle of these games usually is pretty simple, especially like the historical games. You got some information, you learn the information through some interactive part, then you are a little bit playing with it, and then it's the, the, the game is testing you and realizing if you actually learn it. So that's not much difference of the standard type of education. And uh, that's it. These games are sometimes not that interest, uh, entertaining because they've been created. Firstly, the game design was created by the idea we will teach you something. So Lipa Learning, for example, you know, sit around the table and said we will teach kids how to count to 10 and then they start bending the gameplay rules around this idea, not the other way around. And same in the case of Czechoslovakia, the game, the, the creators were actually working, this, is, this was mainly created at Charles University, but they, are, they worked with the Czech Academy of Sciences, which like for first, I don't know, nearly a year, just prepared the documents, the content that the game will be around. So they, uh, they in the end, these type of ga games are just tools. And from my point of view, even though they are more attractive than like a de textbook or like a documentary that you can see in a, a history class, they are more or less the same. They are just different type of textbook. They are maybe more interactive, more fun, but it still works. It's just a tool to improve your educational process. I'm not saying it's a good or bad. I'm just saying you that uh, we shouldn't be like praising games that they can achieve something that they can't. So that's the first part. The second group were serious games. Uh, I got another like a question for you. Anybody heard the term serious games? Can you raise your hand or have some slightly idea what that is about? So the game developers uh, know, but probably the other people does not. But the definition is not uh, really like 
unified, there are plenty of explanations, but usually, I will try to say it from the uh, best way possible, usually it's a game that's a um, main purpose, uh, or main gameplay purpose is not entertainment. Uh, and it can be something else. So the main gameplay or game design purpose, not gameplay, the game design purpose, so what's gonna be the purpose of the game is not usually not entertainment. That's not like the initial idea of the developers. But it also doesn't mean that it's education, like in the case of educational games. It's something else. And what can it be? It can be like simulation. These are like the first examples that it started the, the era of, of serious games. So simulations like flight simulator, where we are just flying, but they are trying to be as accurate as possible and you actually um, simulate the real process of uh, driving or like controlling airplane with all the buttons and everything. But you've got other simulations like medical, uh, medical simulation games where you actually learn stuff about the, the body. And then you can go even deeper, like in 2005 to 10, around that a super successful game uh, called Second Life which was trying to simulate economics and impacts on different things, among other things that this, this, uh, this virtual world simulated. So that's one thing, but I got this game. And this game is quite exception because it's a not Czech game. It's a Polish game created by my friends from 11-bit studio. Uh, so it's been created in Poland. And right now, it's considered like the typical example of serious games. The game is completely fictional. Uh, it's not based on anything like uh, that really happened. Uh, and the 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 like the purpose is put to put you you as a player into super difficult decisions. That's like the main thing that you are doing in the game. And I got another trailer from that, so you don't have to listen to me all the time. For soldiers, war is about victory. For us, it was about the Specified, but there is war all around you. But uh, it's very different from all the other like action games where you are a superhero and you've got plenty of guns, or you are a soldier, or like police officer, or somebody that uh, that actually can like create maybe some difference or something. You are here just civilian. You are uh, somebody that's got some basic set of skills, like you can walk, you can jump, you can run, and maybe not much uh, longer and jump not much higher. And you can basically grab, uh, grab stuff and maybe talk to people, obviously you can talk to people, but that's about it. And you're trying to survive in this very hostile environment, but that's not like the point. Uh, of course, at one point you are trying to, to survive and get food and there is problem with heating because there is um, winter everywhere around you, so you are constantly freezing and you need to cover like basic needs for yourself. But after that, you realize that there are people that actually depends on you, and some of them are your friends, or you create uh, some kind of bond throughout playing the, the game with, other, with these other people. And not then the, the game like hurts you and you like go into the world and realize that there is some like el elderly lady that needs uh, your help but you know that if you did not return in five minutes 
to your like long-term friend with some medicine, he will probably die. But you also know that if you don't help the lady, she probably won't make it to her home safely or something like that. And the game is pretty, pretty depressive and there are obviously no right or wrong decisions. Sometimes you feel that every decision is wrong and the game is definitely not built around the fact that there is some solution that you will like uh, win. There is like the good answer or like the, there is some puzzle that you need to solve. No, it's like just every option is very, very hard. And that's the thing, the, the game, the, the purpose of the game was to create some sort of awareness of like uh, issues that are happening probably in worlds that uh, in some countries where it's war and some probably there are civilians with maybe similar problems but you are just not aware of it so it was uh, the idea was to create awareness of these problems and make you think of it so it was not entertainment it was something else and that's why this world of mine become sort of uh, leader in terms of serious games. But uh, if we are talking like edu educational, what this game can actually like teach you, right? And uh, the, the answer, at least for me, it can teach you a little bit of yourself. How will you decide what will be your choices and how will you go through the game? So that's what you can learn from the game. So that was like a quick part about serious games. And the last thing are the purely entertainment games. The thing that is everywhere around you. These Call of Duties, Leagues of Legends, World of Warcraft, and many others. I could name all of them and pick, nitpick some things that are actually um, teaching you stuff. But again, I'm going to go with the Czech example, Kingdom Come Deliverance. This is the game uh, that's been released last year. Uh, it's been created mainly as an entertainment thing. Uh, the game, like premise, the main thing is that it's historically accurate and it's set in a uh, medieval era. So I got another trailer from that. I'm sorry, I'm always like volumeing it out. If you are interested in these trailers, you can find it on YouTube and many other videos from these games and, and, and watch them fully. So this game, uh, it's really like high production value game. Um, and uh, the game is open world. It's RPG, which stands as for role playing games. You are basically playing as a character within the story. You are controlling his actions and the character is developing throughout the game. The, ro the open world thing means that uh, you are set sometimes this type of games, maybe not that much Kingdom Come, but to some extent, yes, are called also like sandbox, that you are set in the world and you can basically do whatever you want. In case of Kingdom Come, you are still limited to some abilities that the developers gave you, but you still can go wherever you want within the era of the of the land that uh, that's been created there for you. But if you see some hill, you can go there. If you see some castle, you can go there. If you want to talk with this person, you can. If you just want to follow him, you can. If you want to pick a fight and smash him in the face, you still can do that. And sometimes even you can like. Uh, uh, stab them with the knife. This is probably not very nice and there will be consequences and you will end up in jail and it's going to be not good for your character because you did something that you should not be doing, uh, which means like stabbing random people. Uh, so, but the game gives you the opportunity to do these sort of things. So, it's obvious that the game was not uh, designed with the idea that it will like teach you much. But because it's a, a historically accurate, 
because of historical accuracy, it's based on the real events that actually happened, and that's quite important. We can we can assume that maybe it can teach you a little bit of history. So let me give you a little bit more introduction. The question is: so uh, how many of you are there? Anybody who played the game? Anybody who played Kingdom Come? Perfect. Nobody. Great. So I will spoil you a little bit, but. That doesn't matter. Th these are like the basic stuff. If you be playing the game, you will learn it uh, in the beginning. So the game is happening in 15th century, exactly 1403. And it, the setting of the game is land of Bohemia, which is basically current Czech Republic. And uh, there are things that are happening. So another one last question. Have you, uh, I guess there are some Czech people, but for, for people that are not Czech, have, uh, have some of you been in Prague? So, yeah, some of you, yes. So if you've been in Prague, you've probably uh, seen some Charles things, like Charles Bridge, like Charles University, Charles Square, everywhere Charles. That's because of Charles of Charles IV, that actually uh, built the bridge and established the university and many other things, which was one of the greatest uh, person in Czech history, and uh, Charles IV was king of Bohemia, and he was king of many other lands, and he was emperor of Holy Roman Empire, so his titles are big, there is lots of it. And if you are into history, not like me, I'm not into history, so don't ask me any historical question, but if you are, you probably would know that Charles IV died somewhere around 1378, and this game is happening like 25 years later, so Charles IV is long time dead, that's fine, and we are talking about his sons. The story, the historical events is around his sons. Uh, one is Wenceslav IV, who was at the time king of, king of Bohemia, and the other is Sigismund, uh, king of Hungary and king of many other kingdoms, and they got some problem between them. And Charles IV obviously had many other children, but this story is about these these two, and that's one of the setting. I'm, and I'm telling you this because uh, we will come to some conclusion with it. So, here is the problem: the game is trying to entertain you, and the way you should be entertained is that you got some control, some power over the game. You are making decisions. That's why it's engaging, why it immerses you. That's how the creators are thinking about it. But if these events really happened, and if these people really lived, and you go there and meet Wenceslav IV and stab him and kill him, but in reality he should have died 20 years later, it's a problem because you change history. And same for like major battles. If there was this battle and you are on one side and uh, decide to... to influence the battle the way that the wrong side wins, which really did not happen in the history, you are creating another change of history, and that's a problem. So how to solve this thing? It's easy, you create some uh, irrelevant fictional story, which is exactly this case, irrelevant for the like grand scheme of things. So basically you are here playing as some unknown commoner called Henry, and he's son of blacksmith, and your parents actually are killed, which you will run really early in the game, and your village is burned, so you are going on some adventure. But that's fictional. But all the other things around you, that the non-player characters are talking to you and, and, and uh, giving you some information, are sometimes touching things that really happen at the time, and through that, you are learning things, but you can influence it. You are playing your own story. So, from that way, you can actually learn stuff. So you meet somebody and then somebody is telling you, yeah, 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 30 years ago it was a great times because we had this awesome king, Charles IV, right? And nowadays it's pretty, it, it sucks because we've got the Wenceslas and, and he's like trash. So at this point you learn about his personality and the game actually includes like encyclopedia inside it and you can open it and learn more stuff about the, uh, the Charles IV. And Hopefully, I was right about the date when he died. So, you can learn stuff through the game. The question is, uh, will the players really learn stuff 
by playing these type of games? And the answer is not much. Because uh, they want to enjoy the game, they want to just play it and go through it, and they are not paying much attention to these things that the authors created for you. So in reality, like less than 5% of the players would be able to answer you who actually this Venceslav IV was. And they probably, like quite a lot of them, would know that it's happening somewhere in Bohemia and that's the current Czech Republic, but that's about it. And less than 1% of the players are actually going through these uh, in-depth information within the game. So the impact of the game is not that significant, even though you are trying to bring the players uh, as much information. And they are constantly, the game is like 70 hours long and you are playing it a lot and still it does not influence you that much. So don't give games that much credit. But for some players it does. So this was like the one, uh, one part and um, I know I'm a little bit longer, but this uh, we are getting too, too closely to the end. So one part is history. This is a historical game, so you can learn uh, something from history. Most players probably won't, but they can. The second thing in this particular case is geography. You can learn a little bit of, of uh, what, what the, the country look like and something like that. So this is overview of the actual game, how the game looks like, and there is some, uh, I think, Ratai castle. And here is the map of the game. I know that uh, it's not going to be really, really visible here, and uh, but there you can see the river uh, flowing and, and doing, and there are like villages around it. You can see Samopesh and Merhoje, the Talberg, and the Ratai are down there. So good stuff, right? And then this is the screenshot I took recently. It's not really visible, but that's from Google Maps. And there's the same area, so you can see that the river is more or less the same. And there is some option, there is Meruet, and there is down there Ratai, and there is uh, Townberg, where is another castle. So in reality, the creators of the game really took the real data and even go through historical books and recreate it the landscape based on reality. So if you are moving freely in th through the world, you are actually a little bit learning uh, about geography. And it's not just about the games, uh, landscape and the countryside and something like that, but it's also about all the historical buildings. So as you can see, this is a very tricky picture. Um, this uh, left side is, is actually a photograph that's been taken, I don't know, 2000. 16 and the right side is actually a picture from the game so they've been recreating all the historical castles and not just that they look at them in the current form but they were trying to recreate them how they look like this 600 years ago and because the, this this picture it will be fully which i don't have unfortunately it will show you that most of the castle which is on the left side is ruin so the right part from the game is actually doing it quite favor because there is like a ruin of the castle. Uh, but there are other buildings like this. This is the Sasau Monastery and again left side is a photograph and right side is from the game and you can see that it is very very close. And if you go right now on social media, media and look for Kingdom Come you will see that people are posting lots of these sort of pictures online. So yeah, players can, t uh, can learn from games a little bit of geography if they want to. Uh, some of them probably won't, but some part yes. And some people actually take many steps further and buy tickets from, plane tickets from all around the world and come to, come to this central Bohemia in Czech Republic and visit these places. So for example, uh, the game, as I already told you, was released in February 2018. And for summer 2018, there were like four times bigger attendance at uh, Sasau Monastery because the fans just arrived and wanted to see it for real. So that's the geography. The last part with the game, such as Kingdom Come, can teach, can teach you, and this is like the major part, is that you are actually experiencing the world. And that's something that other forms of media can't recreate. 
or very hardly. You are really part of the world. You are talking with the people. You are living a life. You are developing. You are actually creating friendships within the game. But most, uh, mostly, you are just interacting with the world. And through that, you are learning lots of stuff. What am I talking about? Like, if you, you start in a village, and there are plenty of other NPCs that are controlled by super complicated AI system. And these NPCs got their patterns of behaving. So if you are in village and there are commoners and they are working on a field, they go there and you can follow them and see their daily routines. And you can learn stuff from that. And you can see and go to pub and uh, see like what they are eating and talk to the, talk to the, uh, bar lady or somebody like that and and she will tell you what's like the food like and how it's gonna be and then you can go to cities and not cities like the castles castles like our smaller cities and you will see different professions that the, that the people in 15th century were doing and i'm not saying that this is something like super revolutionary and that you are learning like crazy new stuff but you are learning that and uh, you can also learn stuff about the clothing, that's a huge part of the game, and you actually interacting with the clothes because you are putting it on your character, on your main character that you are controlling, and you will see that if you are like a commoner, uh, what type of clothes you're probably wearing, and if you go to the castle, there are people dressed completely differently, maybe more colorful, and you can visit uh, or... Uh, later on you will meet nobility and they are again wearing completely different clothes. So the studio were really pay uh, paying lots of attention to small details and you will learn stuff. You will learn stuff about like medicine because some of the quests and tasks that you need to do uh, will be around it and you are not thinking about it uh, much. It's not like you are reading text or something but you are just like getting into your mind. So the difference is that at the beginning, you wouldn't be probably able to answer what herbs were picked uh, to healing stuff in the 15th century. But after playing the game, you probably will be able to answer that. And that's quite a thing. And if you are into it and want to learn more, you can always open the encyclopedia within the game and learn more how the women actually lived in the Middle Ages or some other topics. It's already there but maybe you won't most likely won't do that but you will learn it just by experiencing the game and this effect that just by playing just by experiencing the world you learn so much led to some smart people some professors at few universities i know actually about two from Czech Republic that included the game as part of the like curriculum of the history classes so they actually offering or telling students to play the game, not because they will learn stuff about Charles IV and Sigismund, because they probably should know if they are studying history at university, especially in Czech Republic, but because they can experience and learn like little details about the lives. We still need to be aware that this is simplification. The game is simplified to some extent, but uh, even the simplify for is uh, pretty good. So that's that. That's uh, that's all from me. I know I'm a little bit longer, but uh, thank you for your attention. I think uh, there is a possibility for some question and answers, so I can answer you that if I know the answer. So thank you. <laughs>